Uh, good to see you again, and also some new folk joining us. What we're doing on these evenings early in Holy Week is, uh, in reflection and with the help of some poetry, we're following Jesus in his journey both out there and back then into Jerusalem, but also in some sense in here and right now. Uh, into um, the city of our own hearts and perhaps breaking down some of the barriers, uh, the unnecessary barriers that he finds there. Um, and it's breaking barriers I particularly want to focus on. This is the day, the Tuesday, when traditionally we think about um, what's called the cleansing of the temple. Um, uh, which I find always is a slightly kind of strange phrase. It sounds like a thorough spring clean or something. But uh, what, of course, the vivid image is of him overturning tables, knocking over the tables of the buyers and the sellers. Just to give you the verses we might be beginning to, uh, to think about. Um, we were in Luke's narrative, so we'll just uh, stay there. This is Luke 19.45. Then he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. He said, it is written... Uh, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And Mark's version, which we'll be hearing later in the service, actually has him knocking the table over. Actually, that bursting in, that overthrowing a barrier, and it was a barrier, by the way, the reason why the money changes were there was because the whole... Uh, Understanding in the law, in the Torah, of the, the three great categories of things, as it were, which was there, was there was the holy, which is God, and those things which have been made holy by being dedicated to God, such as the inner sanctum of his temple. And then there's the clean, which has been purified and is capable of therefore being brought close to the holy. And then there is the unclean. The clean is the kind of buffer state. And you could say the entire, as it were, temple cult Jew Jewish religious system was based on a, an elaborate system for making sure that the unclean never came in contact with the holy. And that, of course, famously is why the priest and the Levite walked by on the other side of the road um, when the man was left for dead, because if he had been dead, they would have contacted the unclean, thus becoming unclean themselves, and they were on their way to the holy. So, of course, uh, one of the most unclean of unclean things, in you know, apart from pigs, was Gentile money. But since they were occupied by the Gentile Romans, you know, Gentile money was what you had to get on with. But uh, the idea was that you couldn't possibly, even though you were coming to make yourself clean by sacrifice, by sacrificing doves and pigeons and things, you couldn't even buy that somebody had worked out, cannily, a new little subsection C of the bit of Leviticus that was hardly there, you couldn't even buy the dove that you would sacrifice to make yourself pure enough to come out of the outer temple and into the, into the inner court. You couldn't even buy that with dirty Roman money. So you had to go and queue up at the kind of bureau de change and the exchange rate and swap it for nice, clean, specially minted holy temple money uh, with, with a surcharge and a commission. And then, once you bought your nice, clean, holy temple money, then you would give it back to them again and buy, buy the pigeon, which they would then sell to you, and then they'd take off and charge you for sacrificing it as well. So they were onto a nice little learner here. But the whole thing was rigged up in a way, visually. It must have presented literally a physical barrier, the queues and the waiting, and you wouldn't get past <coughs> the tables until you'd got the clean money, and then you wouldn't get past the next thing until you got the doves, and so you can see. You can see, therefore, the anger of Jesus um, when, when he says, it is written, my father's house will be a house of prayer, you've made it the den of robbers. Because the temple itself, you remember, was itself only a kind of mimesis or imitation in stone of that sacred place which had been the tent of meeting when they were a pilgrim people, when they were intimate with God walking in the desert. And when they could come in to the tent of meeting, and of course at the far end of the tent of meeting was the Ark of the Covenant and the angels over it. And that, you know, that tabernacle, that meeting place with God, that was, 
even when he dreamt of building it, Solomon was hesitant about you know, making this thing instead. He realized there were, there were issues around that. And so that this place, which was meant to represent the meeting of God with humanity, the coming together, had become itself a series of intricate barriers separating. So Jesus comes and breaks the barrier. And if there's one, as it were, watchword for what I want to do in our reflections and in the poetry we're about to read this evening, I, I would express it in that hymn. Um, I love this hymn, Just As I Am. And um, there's a great verse and it says, Just as I am, thy love unknown hath broken every barrier down, now to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come. So Jesus breaks down that outward and visible barrier. But I'd like to suggest that that breaking of that barrier, overturning the tables of the money changers, is really the beginning of a series of episodes of what you might call breaking and entering that, <laughs> that Jesus undertakes. Uh, and which goes to the heart of the passion. He comes to this barrier and he goes through it and makes a path. But on Good Friday, he is going to, I think, make a path through three more barriers, one of which also has its symbolic visibilia in the temple. And the first is the barrier of physical human death. That barrier which, in a lot of our thinking, is not so much a barrier or a toll gate as, quite frankly, and in every possible sense of that term, a dead end. But we've got a lovely phrase in the prayer book which we talk about the grave and gate of death. And he was to prove the grave to be a gate, and indeed to be a gate that he could open. And so he was going to pass through that barrier of our physical dying and take life itself through the grave and gate of death, not just his life privately, but all of our lives, all of us in him. So in him was life, the life was the light of every person. So the life that was your light was taken personally already in advance, long before your own dying comes, has already been taken <clears throat> through the grave and gate of death by Jesus. That's why Paul has that wonderful exclamation in one of his letters where he says, but you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. He's already taken it through. Uh, it's almost to use a, if I can use a sporting analogy, you know, sort of playing rugby, they can only tackle you got the ball, if you passed it on, you know, you can't be. And there's a sense in which when death comes to take your life, you can reasonably say, sorry mate, I haven't got it. I've already passed it on to Jesus. He's, 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 he's run ahead with it. You know, it's, it's actually safe already elsewhere. So he breaks a barrier of death down. But then comes another barrier which we've actually almost completely forgotten about. I suppose if there's a time for it to be broken, it's Holy Saturday. It's there in the creed, but we, we never mention it. We say, well, he, he died, he was crucified for us. And then there's that little line in this creed, he descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And of course, the final one is going to be the gates of heaven will be open. But I want to focus for a minute on he descended into hell. He broke open a gate to let us into the temple. Broke open. What about breaking in open something to let us out? What about a libera me, domine, de mortis eterne, as the, um, the Latin song has it, or deliver us from evil? Liberate us. There's a wonderful tradition of thinking about Christ's descent into hell. Uh, which is known generically as the harrowing of hell. And uh, I find it a particularly powerful and helpful way of thinking about a lot of things. Both, I find a very helpful way of thinking that in the story of the harrowing of hell, as you'll see in it when I read your poem about it, the idea is that 
Jesus goes down, and then everybody who has ever done it, as it were, not knowing him, not aware of him, you know, in living in previous ages, all the patriarchs and the prophets, and going right back, figuratively speaking, as it were, to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and Rob, are all somehow stuck in there. And that Jesus is overcoming of death, Jesus is offering of his life, Jesus is kind of covering the covering sin and, and redeeming and reconciling the world to God. It's all done for them as well. You know, there's a rotten luck if you just happened to have been born BC, wouldn't you? And some of the earliest representations in the Orthodox Church, in the iconic tradition, of the resurrection don't show Jesus rising alone. They show him arising out of the sepulchre, holding Adam and Eve by the hand. And of course, in Adam and Eve, you could say he's holding all of humanity, that is, if you like, trapped in death. Um, and I find that a very powerful idea. I find it very helpful in terms of thinking about, uh, because I do believe that God ultimately meets us in Christ and ultimately finds and saves us in Christ. And therefore I believe there has to be a, a vivifying, an opportunity, if you like, for a vivifying, all-redeeming, love-restoring encounter with Christ for every human being. And I don't see why a little thing like chronology should get in the way. So... Um, that's a, a way of thinking about those things. Real choices are available. Uh, so that's one of the ways of thinking about, about the harrowing of hell. That a way is broken in and a way is opened up. And um, I want to read you now a little bit of, it's brought into slightly more modern English, a little bit of a medieval poem um, called Piers Plown, which has, it's a literary poem, um, 14th century, which has a, a description of the harrowing of hell. It's actually much more about it. this wonderful back chat between the devil and the other fiendikins, as, uh, as the author of Pierce Plowman, William Langland, calls them. Uh, but I just, uh, there's a wonderful bit in which here, you're, in which the barrier is broken, the gates are opened. And it seems to me, perhaps the, the overturned of the tables of the money changers, let's put it this way, perhaps <coughs> the tables of the money changers, whether they are uh, across the temple in Jerusalem in the days uh, of the Passion, or whether they're actually across uh, high-rise buildings in Wall Street, or even, who knows, dare I say, the gates of St. Paul's Cathedral occasionally, uh, wherever they are, those tables that keep people away or trap people in, maybe they're the antechamber of hell. So maybe the breaking of the gates of hell is part of that same breaking. So let me read this to you. Um, uh, don't say to yourself, oh my goodness, this is medieval poetry. I must be very solemn and learned. Med medieval poetry is not solemn and learned. Uh, yeah, sometimes I feel solemn and learned to understand it, but the poetry itself tends to be quite right, as anyone who reads Chaucer. So, again the light bade unlock, so he's come to the closed gates of hell, see. again the light bade unlock, and Lucifer answered, what lord art thou, quod Lucifer, quis sesisti, rex gloria, the light soon says, king of glory, and lord of might of main and of all manner of virtues, dominus virtutum, Dukes of this dim place, anon undo these gates, that Christ may come in, the King's Son of Heaven. And with that breath, hell broke. And Balliol's bars, in spite of wide or ward, wide, white or ward, wide open the gates. Patriarchs and prophets. Populous in Tenebris sang St. John's song. Ecce Agnus Dei. Lucifer might not look so light him blinded. And those that our Lord loved, into his light he took. And said to Satan, Lo, here, my soul to amend for all sinful souls, to save those that be worthy. Mine they be and of me. I may the better than claim. Although reason record and write of myself that if they eat the apple all should die, I promise them not here hell forever. For the deed that they did, thy deceit it made, 
with guile thou got them against all reason, for in my palace, paradise, in person of an adder, falsely thou fetchest thence the thing that I love. Thus, like a lizard with a lady's visage, like a thief thou me robbest, the old law granteth that beguilers be beguiled, and that is good reason. Dentem pro dente, et oculum pro oculo, ergo, soul shall soul quit, and sin drive out sin, and all that man hath misdone, I, man, will amend. Member for member, by the old law made amends, and life for life also, and by that <coughs> law I claim it. Adam and all his issue at my will hereafter, and what death in them undid, my death shall relieve, and both quicken and purchase what was destroyed through sin, that grace guile destroy, good faith it asketh. So believe it not, Lucifer, that against the law I fetch them, but by right and by reason ransom here my allegiance. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it's great, so to say. You know, um, it's kind of Christ slightly getting his own back on, you know, the devil appearing, of course, to tempt Christ in the wilderness and quoting the scripture at him and quoting bits of the Old Testament at him. So, 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 so Christ here comes back and he says, right, well, you know, an eye for an eye, and it's important to you because you saw that light in the air. You nick them, I'm nicking them back, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and isn't that lovely uh, reading of the Genesis story? You know, mm -hmm. there might have been death, but nobody was promised hell. You know, you invented hell, you created this thing. It's kind of God actually disowning hell and saying, no, you know, actually, these people belong in paradise and I've come to get them. But there's also still that sense of that sacrifice and I'm sort of giving myself. But um, if I were, uh, what did you just remember one phrase? You love to bother to get the alliterative poetry. This, although he's writing at the same time as Chaucer, he's obviously much more linked back to that Anglo-Saxon tradition, and so it's rooted in that wonderful alliterative uh, line, which we still keep the folk memory of in phrases like "might and main," for example, fighting for your might and main, kith and kin, and that, that kind of thing. Um, but if there was one phrase I wanted you to remember out of this alliterative poetry. Uh, I think it would be this one. With that breath, hell broke. That almost it's just the breath, the speech of God, the Spirit of God sent forth. He just, he just blows the doors of hell down. And, as it were, his Spirit comes in, his breath. And I think that with that breath, hell break has some relation to that moment on the cross when he says, to thy hands, like my spirit. He breathed his last. This is though almost before the, the spirit lands with the Father and, and then brings it kind of swoops down, breathes through, blows open the gates of hell, kind of whisks up um, uh, all those who want to be with him there and kind of carries them to heaven with that breath. Um, hell broke. And it's a wonderful. Um, you can see, of course, Langland is deeply soaked in the liturgy of the church, and he's creatively taking snatches and phrases that everybody had heard um, and reapplying them to his story. So, like populace in Tenebra, the people who walked about in darkness have seen a marvelous light upon those who dwell in deep darkness. Uh, the light has shone, you know, which we use in our, on the age sets. So, with that breath, hell breath. Now, something else happened go back, as it were, to the lit surface of the world, to the events in Jerusalem, remembering that everything out there is in here. When that breath came that could break hell, the second marriage, you know, I can unmarry, it broke another thing still. We're told in the Gospel that when Jesus died at that moment, as he breathed his last, the veil in the temple was torn <coughs> That's the last barrier. The, I talked to you about the barrier they had to get through to get from the outer court of the Gentiles into the inner court where everything had to be clean. But of course, you know, there was a further thing. There was the, the sanctum sanctorum, as it was called, the Holy of Holies, which was separated off by a veil, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And only the high priest, only on one day a year, 
Day of Atonement, only covered with the blood of a sacrificial lamb and with the names of the tribes of Israel sewn ritually into his coat. The uh, high priest of that year would go through the veil into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for the people. And that's what happened. Outwardly, one man sprinkled with the blood of an animal upon who, 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 you know, who, who obviously had no choice in the matter. And of course, it was all very bad, <coughs> but it all had to be done again next year. <coughs> New set of sins to be atoned for. And he'd no sooner gone in to make that atonement than the veil was returned, and nobody could go, nobody could pass through that. So what does it mean when we say that when Jesus died, veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. It means that once and once only, this hymn says once for all, absolutely, that barrier, that veil, that curtain, that sense that we don't belong, that we're not part of the holy, that if you like excludes us from the heart of heaven, is simply taken away. And it's taken away not by some outwardly representative high priest with, you know, our family name, so it's somewhere into his vestments. But it's taken away by Jesus, who takes the whole of who we are into himself, that's what he means to say, he was made flesh, and takes us as we are through that veil, and takes us not just to a place in a physical location in a temple that represents the presence of God. We'll really see the completion of this action, not only on Easter Day, but on Ascension Day, when we say him, in a sense, taking our very nature and who we are to the right hand of the Father. But all of that, to me, is kind of foreshadowed on this Tuesday's event. He starts by breaking down this stupid socio-political piece of combined financial jiggery-pokery and liturgical nonsense, which somehow the temple had got itself involved in, and which, frankly, churches have carried on getting themselves involved in the things, and he just sweeps it aside. But that's not a temporary piece of ecclesiastical reform. That's motivated by the deep desire to bring the whole of lost and broken and wounded humanity, made whole and healed again, right into the heart of heaven to share the love of God. That's what he's doing. So that's why he breaks the other barriers down too. And uh, it begins with that. And that, it seems to me, just to say a final thing, is the spirit in which we ourselves ought to do a certain amount of barrier breaking and barricade bashing and breaking and entering generally. There are lots of these tables of the money changers, culturally and socially thrown up by the church, saying where in and you're out, and excluding people. And we really have not got to have anything to do with that. I'm really, I'm really glad to be part of church machine in this church. It's, and is, is an inclusive church and is aiming always to be a more inclusive church. And I'm sure there's more we can do. And as we become aware of barriers thrown up, then we need to throw them down. But we don't throw them down in a, in a, in a spirit of mere trendiness or political correctness. And we don't throw them down in, you know, in some sense of just, just you know, a little bit of generally anarchistic mayhem, fun as that is. We, we do it, I think, with Jesus and with the same aim of Jesus, which is to to bring those who need his love into Christ and in Christ into the heart of heaven to the Father's love and the Spirit's love. And anything that stands in the way of that is fair game for our barricade bashing in the name of Jesus. Oh, stop there. But do take away your prayer.